We've reviewed vision and hearing. Now let's look at some of the other senses. Smell and taste. The sense of smell is called olfaction. Smell actually results from molecules of a solid or a liquid being vaporized by heat into a gas. This is how you can smell bread baking in the oven when you're in another room in the house. What happens is that small molecules of the bread break off and escape the oven and float back to wherever you're at and fly up the nostrils. It's almost like your nose is eating that food. This is also why our sense of smell seems to be better on a hot afternoon in July and August compared to a freezing day outside in January or February. We have millions and millions of olfactory neurons in our nostrils and we have a thousand different types of smell receptors. However, we're not as good as dogs because they have more sensory olfactor neurons. But studies have shown that mothers and newborns can recognize their baby smell within hours of delivery. How about taste? Has anyone ever had a severe head cold and food didn't seem to taste so good? Did you all of a sudden lose your taste buds? What's going on here? Well, turns out there's nothing wrong with your tongue or your taste buds when that happens. The problem is really with your smell receptors in the nostrils. You see, most of our taste sense it really results from molecules forced up the nasal cavity from chewing. So even if you had no taste buds, smell would probably provide you with some taste sensation. We have four traditional taste bud receptors sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Now these can be detected all over the tongue and even inside the mouth areas. But there is research to suggest there are some concentrations on different parts of the tongue. Sweet receptors would appear to be concentrated on the tip of the tongue. Sour and salty receptors are concentrated on the sides of the tongue. And bitter taste receptors, they seem to be more concentrated at the very back of the tongue. Can you think of an adaptive or survival value to having more bitter taste receptors at the back of the tongue? Think about it. Skin senses. The skin is our biggest organ covering the body. There's one type of skin sensation that I want to focus on most and this is pain. Pain is incredibly complex. Researchers are still not quite sure how pain works. Do you believe that pain can have a psychological component? And if so, does that mean that pain is all in the head? We define chronic pain as pain that persists for three months or longer. Pain consists of a physical component and a suffering component. Suffering consists of the emotional response to pain. In fact, today, we think of pain as a complex emotion. What contributes to pain? Well, we know this much. Pain is made worse if you have negative thoughts about the pain. Pain is made worse if you fear the potential threat to your well-being. And pain is made worse if it triggers feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. Endorphins are the body's natural painkillers. And endorphins are released when you're injured or under stress cry, or if you're in pain. Endorphins can even be released when you think you receive a painkiller, even though you don't. This is the placebo effect that we studied earlier in the course, and it can be done to gain a therapeutic response. Pain is incredibly complex, but the leading theory on how pain works is called the gate control theory of pain. Here is what the theory says. Pain is caused by small, slow-conducting nerve fibers. These nerve fibers reach a theoretical gate in the spinal cord, causing it to open. But when you're in pain, you might 
Rub, massage, apply ice or heat to the pain. We seem to do this because it helps activate large fast conducting nerve fibers to compete. These large fast conducting nerve fibers carry other sensory information to tie up traffic at the gate. And when this happens, it effectively closes the gate and keeps pain messages from getting through. Here's an analogy that may make sense. Remember the old joke about the guy who complains of a headache? His buddy tells him to lay out his hand on a tabletop and then he smashes his buddy's hand with a hammer. He asks, how's your headache? And you say, my headache's gone, but now my hand hurts. This is the idea of competing stimuli. The gate control theory also helps us understand how emotional and psychological factors affect pain. The brain can send messages down to the spinal cord to in effect block or close that gate. For example, it is well known how a soldier in the battlefield can be distracted and not feel pain from an injury until afterwards. It's also well known how athletes can be distracted and not feel pain until after the game. A little bit about the vestibular sense related to balance and movement. This sense detects movement and provides information about the body's orientation in space. The vestibular sense organs are located in the semicircular canals in the inner ear. Now think about this. If you were blindfolded in a jet plane and couldn't see, you could feel takeoff and landing and any sudden changes. You would sense acceleration and deceleration, but once you got up to altitude and the constant cruising speed of at least 600 miles an hour, you wouldn't sense that. This is because the vestibular sense only picks up changes in motion and orientation. Once you get to a constant cruising speed, this is what allows us to get up and walk around the cabin. Having a good vestibular sense, by the way, is very important in athletics. Well, that's the main stuff on sensory receptors and sensation. Now, let's look at perception and topics pertaining to that. Remember, sensation is all about getting the sensory impulse up to the brain, and then the brain takes over this is called perception. Principles of perception, perceptual organization and constancy. Now you may can take a car engine apart and study all the component parts. You can put the engine back together and it resumes working just fine. But try to break down a perception and then put that back together. You'll come up short. Something is missing. What is it? This was the problem of structuralism and the early introspectionists. It seems that when sensory elements are brought together, something new is formed. You cannot understand perception by breaking down experience into tiny parts. You cannot understand perception by then analyzing each tiny part separately in isolation from each other. A popular expression in psychology is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. What is added to sensory elements are principles of organization and constancy. The brain does this in order to create meaning, which the brain seems to need. Here are some principles that govern all perceptions in human being. Look at the figure in your book that outlines these basic principles of perceptual organization. And these include figure ground, similarity, proximity, continuity, and closure. Perceptual constancy allows us to perceive objects as maintaining stable properties. Two of these I want to focus on are size and shape. Size constancy. When someone walks away, the retinal image actually becomes smaller. A person can stand right next to you and you know they're five or six feet tall but they walk away in the distance and they become smaller like the size of a quarter. And yet, how do we know that the person is still the same size and they didn't shrink? 
This is due to size constancy, which is a very good thing, isn't it? Shape constancy. When someone opens a door, the retinal image, strictly speaking, changes from being a rectangle to a trapezoid. And yet, how do you know the door is still the same shape? We call that shape constancy. Size constancy and shape constancy are very important to have, aren't they? Depth perception related to vision is also a topic that interests psychologists. You see, the eye's retina provides only a two-dimensional view of the world, flat like a photograph. So, how do I move and navigate in the space of a 3D world? How can I judge distance? We rely on binocular and monocular depth cues. The two processes we know most about are convergence and binocular disparity, the latter term also known as retinal disparity. Convergence is when we experience eye muscle tension as our eyes converge on an object. The brain picks up on this as a cue for depth perception. This is because the eyes are literally turning inward. The other process is retinal disparity. The brain integrates two slightly different retinal images up to 20 feet away. The brain then, in a manner of speaking, superimposes these, one on the other, to create 3D perception. Binocular cues, of course, require two eyes. But, can you have depth perception with just one eye? Well, fortunately, we can. Monocular cues require only one eye. Artists have used monocular cues for centuries to create depth in their paintings. Look in the figure in your book that outlines several monocular cues. Some of the more interesting ones are linear perspective, texture gradient, shadow, and interposition. Again, monocular cues just require one eye. You can put your hand over one eye and see how these work. Now, one last topic I want to mention under the heading Unusual Perceptual Experiences is subliminal perception. This is defined as the capacity to perceive and respond to stimuli presented below the threshold of awareness. Do we actually have that? Research shows that the brain responds physiologically to subliminally presented stimuli but it does not produce the type of behavior change that people claim it does in well-controlled studies. And the most common claims are for weight loss, smoking, and studying. Now, clearly some people seem to be influenced by subliminal presentation when they know or when they think they are experiencing subliminal stimuli. But when this happens, what might be an alternative explanation? And a hint is I want you to remember the placebo effect. Well, that's the big stuff on sensation and perception. Talk with you later. Bye-bye.